proud supporters of Africa this week. Anjan, with us, you are number one. Tobias Heinemann, Chief Commercial and Marketing Officer at Rift Valley Railways, spoke to us about the railway sector in Kenya. Basically, with the signature of the debt package, which was done on the 2nd of August this year, we are now prepared for moving the railway system here in Kenya into Uganda into a better world. What we are planning to do is to spend at least a capex of $287 million into the system in the next seven years in order to do four things. First, we are planning to refurbish the permanent way, the tracks. Second, we are planning to um, refurbish and uh, implement better rolling stock, uh, locomotives and wagons. On the third side, we are planning to introduce and implement a new IT program. And last but not least, right. we have special turnaround programs in mind, which we plan to implement in order to mm. improve the whole system and make the whole system more reliable. Now, it's quite a big project that you're describing to us, Tobias. How do you ensure that all the shareholders meet their obligations, the countries involved, mainly Uganda and Kenya, also work in tandem, and that you support local industries? Because we know in the past there have been shareholder spats. That's right. Uh, everybody of the whole management team, the shareholders, uh, the management team, the senior team of RVR, we all know what to do and what we need to implement because we are basically serving the customers and we are serving everybody here in Kenya and Uganda because it is our task to show everybody that moving from road to rail has a big advantage not only for RVR and not only for the customer but also for the whole society, for the government, Currently, the market share of the rail business is at around 6 to 7 percent, which is actually very low. And we are planning to in, in, increase this market share on a year to year basis. We have too many trucks on the road and too many trains running yeah. in these days from Mombasa to Mbakasi and to Kampala. And we definitely need to change that. We've focused obviously on the financing through the syndicated partnership of the consortium that uh, governs RVR. But there's also this issue of how rail investments support local manufacturing industries. That's a big concern across Africa. You're importing locomotives, for instance. The technologies come from countries in Europe. How do we ensure that local industries benefit from this? Well, first and foremost, we are saying we have our, uh, our investments here. We have our rolling stock, which is actually very old. And we have uh, done one management decision. Instead of buying new locomotives in the first uh, two to three years, it is better for us and better for everybody that we start to invest and spend uh, more money for getting spare parts for existing locomotives and existing rolling stocks. And all of those, they are coming from other parts of the world. But we definitely will make sure that all companies being located here in Kenya and Uganda will also get that chance mm. to support us on our way to improve mm. the railway system. You mentioned obviously two streams, uh, passenger rail, cargo rail. Some people would say when you look at the impetus for regional integration in East Africa, whether you're looking at Comesa, whether you're looking at the East African community, there's a strong case for improving trade networks and a strong case for cargo rail as opposed to passenger rail. Where's the money for you? Uh, well, where's the money for us? The money for us is basically on the, on the cargo side. Uh, we are earning more than 90% of our revenues on the cargo side and the passenger business is actually very small business on our side. Therefore, we are concentrating on the cargo, we are concentrating on the logistics, which is coming from the fact that uh, the growth rates here for Kenya and Uganda are at around 4 to 5 percent on a year-to-year -year basis for the next five to seven years. And this causes a huge demand for logistic and better infrastructure and therefore the management decided to concentrate on the cargo side. Another issue is that our concession on the cargo business um, is an, uh, runs for another 20 years basis, whereas our concession for the passenger side expires by end of June next year. So therefore, we cannot do any investment right now on the passenger side. So actually, we are concentrating on the cargo. Senior utility representatives across sub-Saharan Africa gathered in Cape Town this week to share experiences on solar energy. Daniel Blanco, renewable and alternative energy manager at Inatec Energia in Spain, explained Spain's approach to the role of enterprise in climate-friendly energy solutions. 
mean, for me, clear is that it's a mix from the possible technologies that we might have around. I mean, you cannot simply walk away from coal now that you're here in, in South Africa. It wouldn't make any sense. But it's clear that you have a high potential on renewable energies that you should simply not discard. Mm. I mean, they can be as positive for the country as other technologies might be. I mean, although we are signatories to some kind of a Copenhagen pledge, not quite a protocol, and we've committed to reducing uh, greenhouse gases by the year 2030, the fact is we're still very much in an infancy stage in South Africa. As you're saying, we've been using fossil fuels to power our electricity system. I think we know very little about what the best approach ought to be. Um, your suggestions? I mean, so far, the, the issue has been that everybody has been pretty much running in circles, trying mm -hmm. to make a business as much as they could from these different renewable technologies. Yeah. But the problem is that what you need to do is simply try to learn for what has happened in other countries, and not only about their success, but mm -hmm. also about their failures. I mean, if you learn from what other people has already done and not tr try to think all the things over right. by yourself again, things might be a way easier okay, for so, everybody. So don't reinvent the wheel, South Africa. Those who look at our weather patterns say, if you look at the Eastern Cape, there's a strong argument for wind energy because it's quite windy in that part of the country. If you look at the rest of the country, especially the Northern Cape, there's a case for solar energy. The issue is bringing in those technologies seems to be very expensive, especially the solar. It's not really a matter of how expensive or cheap a technology is, and right now solar seems to be expensive is whether it makes a viable business case to anyone who is developing into it. So it's if the return that they get is fair. Mm. I mean, you can buy a very expensive thing, but if you can sell it for a higher price, mm. then you're able to get a fair business case. So right now the problem is that every, everybody's just targeting on what's the price, the price is very expensive. But what we would be trying to look for, or what mm. should be looking for is that, does this make a viable business case? Right. That's pretty much the point. Okay, does it make a viable business case? Because I think for a lot of independent power producers, their negotiations with government have really centered around the refit. It is really a sense of what they invest, they must be able to recover in a decent period of time in this investment. And the fact that you've got to overhaul a system, I mean, you've got to overhaul everything from the way in which houses are constructed in South Africa if you go the solar panel route. The problem in, in that thing is that uh, independent and power producers, if they are small, it's very hard for them to be driving this technology or these markets forward. I mean, solar technologies as well as wind are a high intensive investment. Mm -hmm. So normally it's large companies, the one that have been able to create success. I mean, small producers were not able to get almost anywhere in the United States until they t were taken over by the big ones. The same thing happened in Spain. I mean, there are very few small investors, and mainly on the PV system, and they mm -hmm. have gone very hard times. It's been the big ones, the big companies, when they get into these markets, the ones that are able to drive the market mm -hmm. somewhere. Another of the mistakes in this uh, kind of uh, business is that everybody's looking for government fundings. Mm -hmm. And we should not forget that governments, they don't have more money. So we should try to look for alternative ways of funding this kind of technologies and approaches. And instead of asking the governments for money, asking the governments on how can we make this technology go move forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is pretty much the point. And everybody's making a very wishful thinking about the cost being reduced. And everybody's mm -hmm. thinking economies of scale, massive production. But the truth is that in all these technologies, I mean, mainly PV and concentrated solar power, mm -hmm the cost had been already reaching rock bottom. I mean, glass, steel, PV cells, I mean, they are already being massively manufactured. Mm. So the problem is that price might have a still a little margin, but little, but cost, I mean, we, ha we are not gonna okay, be able do to you, do how that. How do you form an industry like that in a country like South Africa? Because you've got to consider two things. We're living in the renewable era, energy era, at a time when we've got to boost our industrial output and also at a time when we're trying to create jobs. So whatever solutions that solar energy provides is not just towards electricity, it's towards some of the broader problems we have in this economy. So when we talk economies of scale, we like to hear that because if it employs people, we want to see people going into that sector. So if renewables can add to some of those, uh, add those dimensions to broader solutions, then it's something to consider. But if we're talking cottage industry, something small scale, it might not be a pressing case in a country like this. The problem is that in order to reduce this cost, as I was saying, economies of scale, what's happening is that most of the PV cells in the world, PV panels, are being produced in, in China. So all the economies of scales have been reached because they are producing massively in China. Mm. So you think about moving uh, industries here, I don't see how. 
very well. I mean, there are some factories that might be established here, but that's not going to be driving things down in cost. There are some new technologies that are being I mean, they are way beyond the development phase that might be game changers into this because yeah. that they might some kind of this technology that might allow to be a local manufacturer then probably that will reduce the cost massively kind yeah. of game changers. That's the kind of things that a country like South Africa could move forward and probably from South Africa extend right. it on until the rest of Africa. In recent conversations also, because there's a lot of these uh, climate change type conferences taking place, the Americans have been really astounded by the extent to which new regulations require local content. And that's really the context in which people investing in South Africa have to consider is that not only do you need local partners, but you have to ensure that along the supply chain, procurement also targets local industries because, like I say, we've got broader issues to solve. So if the supply chains and the production is happening in Asia, again, it takes away from the priorities of this country. No, that's the problem. That's what I was trying to say before. I mean, but in order to do that, I mean, you cannot put the rules, I mean, you cannot put the horses behind the, behind the cart. Yeah. I mean, what you need to do is just, okay, what do I need? Because you can ask for whatever you want. Mm. I mean, I, I want 100% local content. Mm. That's fair. The problem is that the price is going to be the one that takes to drive this local content forward. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that you need to encourage the people telling them, okay, we're going to develop this local content because you need these rules. And then they will create the local content and then develop the mm -hmm. projects. So it's just trying to sit with the government and not asking the money for the government. It's just trying to explain them what's all the conditions that take this mm -hmm. and how we can get over there and how we can fulfill mm -hmm. what are the needs. Because it's clearly that one of the needs, and it's not only happening in South Africa, the same thing is happening in any, mm -hmm. in any other country. India yeah. is like that. I mean, yeah. They want the local content because one of the things that these technologies or these markets can, be, can drive are these new jobs, new money. If everything is coming from outside, it makes yeah. no sense. Yeah, absolutely right. So you talk about innovative funding models. Just give us a sense of how we can go about it. If the government cannot sponsor the entire solar project and IPPs um, can raise the capital but are going to pass it on to consumers, what's the compromise? Let's look for innovative solutions, and I'm going to say something that, I mean, I just came out with it in a conversation this morning and might not have been very well thought yeah. of. But if you make the industries to invest in solar, let's say you have one of the largest mining companies in the world, if you force them to invest in solar, the issue is that if you force somebody who is selling inside of South Africa, it will always be reverted to the people, to the people in South Africa. But you know, these mining companies, they are selling their products abroad. Mm. So if they reflect this forcing to invest in their product, the product is going to be paid outside of South Africa. Well, that's all for this edition of Africa This Week. Join us again next week for another roundup of the top stories in Africa. From me, Mashuru Masuta, and the team, it's goodbye.